Welcome to the B Shifter Podcast. We've got John Vance, also here today, Chris Stewart and Josh Bloom. How's it going, guys? Fantastic. Happy to be in Phoenix. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. It, jo- Josh has had trouble getting to Phoenix lately. The airline industry hasn't been cooperating with him they very have it well. Out for him. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you made it today because you had a you had a rocky start this morning to begin with. So um, he he called about six a.m. He wasn't quite sure if he was going to make it here or not. So whole new level of risk management. Can't fly the plane because the lavatory's broke. Oh, was that the problem? Yes. Oh, wow. Well, I'm glad you're here. We we have a great topic today because Chris has been out on the road um, teaching a class. Let's talk a little bit about that class before we uh, dive into the topic. And the two kind of have everything to do with each other. So t- tell us about this class and, and who who's it for, what topics you're covering. And it's it's one of the other, it's, it's a new uh, blue card workshop. Well, so it's... It's really for everybody, if you will, right? It's it's for strategic level bosses. Uh, well, I'll, I'll even say higher. Like if we want to talk about policy level bosses, trying to figure out how they're going to set policy, train to policy, that type of stuff, this can support them in a big way. But then looking at uh, the strategic level ICs within an organization, the tactical level bosses in an organization, and the company officer and crew level folks who are either simply just working at that level or every once in a while they bump up to the next level above them is kind of working on a standardized critical thinking process, which is the blue card strategic decision making model that's been around for 100 years, right, is just taking it, applying it for all those levels and then helping an organization or helping the people in the class kind of go through, uh, really understand what it is and then exercise it in a way probably that they may not have ever exercised it before and, and kind of demonstrate to them like really low tech things that you can do to help from the newest firefighter to the most senior executive level of an organization, utilizing the same thinking process and solving problems in the hazard zone. So that's really kind of what, what it's pointed at. I think, you know, we had Wilmington, North Carolina, Carolina ask us about uh, ask us for some uh, assistance with with uh, delivering and kind of connecting the dots and coloring in between the gaps uh, and so we were able to go do that um, I think I think they saw the value there we certainly saw the value after doing that and so now we're 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 offering it as a generic workshop here for anybody to come and take um, but then the opportunity to, to go to specific departments, work with them beforehand and build, you know, wh- what is it that they truly want to work on in their organization? And then we can show up and, my, uh, and myself and, and Eric Phillips uh, are teaching it together. We'll show up and kind of work from that chief company officer level and helping them kind of recognize uh, how to do some of this stuff. Well, the reviews so far have been really good. I mean, everyone who's gone to it has just raved about the class and, uh, they, they are quickly filling up whenever they're announced. Yeah, it's been it's pretty nice, pretty humbling. But, right. they're, but they're a lot of fun to do. Great. Well, I can't wait to to see one of them someday soon. So I that's one Please. of those I, I want to have on my list to attend. Well, today we we want to talk about critical fireground factors because uh, there's some factors that apply to all incidents in the hazard zone, and there's some factors that are are specialized. So where do you want to start today on our our critical fireground factor talk? Well, I think that we we talk about like breaking down the critical factors into into some specific categories, and you know the critical thinking class has really pushed and launched the uh, for every one category, there's not one thousand but thousands of factors that uh, that fall under that, right? And no incidents the same, and uh, so I think when we really start looking at the critical factors, it's like, what is really going on? And in, and in order to know that, we have to be able to identify, you know, what we're really seeing. Really, I think, look at look at all of the factors together somewhat at the same time, but also be able to identify, like, what, what are the key things going on here and what are we going to do about it? So I think that's kind of the, the where, what we talk about today and where we, where we get to. Uh, it keeps running through my mind that, like, <clears throat> that part of a of a blue card class is like a 24 hour class just talking about critical factors because a house isn't an apartment building isn't a mid rise isn't an airplane on the highway crash isn't 
it isn't anything else except for what it is. The 68-year-old lady having a heart attack is the 68-year-old lady having a heart attack isn't the 30-year-old that's having a heart attack that has some other issue that's causing that. And, you know, in the EMS world, I think we we do better with that and we analyze it and we use, you know, the tools that we have available to figure out exactly what's going on and what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. And uh, I think far too often on the fire ground, we, we take and try to make one size fits all and we try to run the super secret play on every single thing and it doesn't work very well. And it's, it's a, I think that comes down to we end up having some accidental success sometimes because I think Eric Phillips says it. A lot of people have said it. You know, one well-placed hand line solves a lot of problems. Well, you're going to be pretty successful if the only thing you're looking at is did the fire go out? So, I mean, I, I think the critical factor thing is is more than we're going to bite off and, and uh, attack, I think, in this one podcast, but it, we're going to start it. Yeah, so it, it's kind of interesting. The, the critical factors – um, at least in my experience, have when they don't when they don't go explained or a really like uh, um, there's not a defined process behind the size up part of it, and then determining your critical factors, they can seem really really overwhelming. Like I'm starting to think of all these serious things happening at this incident, and if they're all critical, and I got to deal with them all, and, I, and and that's really not what they were designed to do. They were actually designed to pick out. All right, what are the most critical things here that we actually have to deal with on the front end, like in a real measurable way? And then what's not critical? And like getting rid of the silliness that isn't doesn't matter right now. And so, yeah, we, we used to use a, the term regularly is when everything's critical, nothing is critical. So, so we need to have a standard process in evaluating and sizing things up in order to be able to to truly prick out what matters right now. What truly are the critical elements of this? The eight, the the, the uh, our standard critical factors, our eight critical factors, um, are really important categories. And like Joshua, there's a ton that goes into that. So it's not just being able to you know, uh, in academically like pick, well, these are them just because I think they are, that's my experience or whatever. No, no, we're going to measure it and we're going to connect it to the tactical priorities because I'm going to have to do work based upon these critical factors. So what really matters right now? And, you know, it's super easy to say, well, just every time we show up at a fire, life safety is a critical factor. Well, that's not always true. Right. And so do we have a standard process to measure whether life safety truly is a critical factor? And if so, our 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 risk management, our strategy and our action better match that. Right. And then when it's not a critical factor through a standard process, then then our plan should should match that. Right. And we shouldn't be doing the things that we normally do because life safety is we believe life safety is an issue when, in fact, we've either through us or through our actions have clarified that it's not. So um, uh, that that process. So if like any academic in um, in in risk management will tell you, if we if you can't truly measure and define the problem, you're like your solutions are likely to suck. Um, and we do have accidental success in that, uh, but one of our focuses is let's let's reduce that accidental success and let's talk about all right how the heck do we measure this stuff and how do we truly define what's critical going on right now at the incident and then act on it like uh, in a in a real way. So before we get too far past it, you know, it comes up in every every train and trainer that we do, and anytime we're helping to build a cert lab, you know, people buzz through that slide: standard conditions, standard action, standard outcome, and you know, I always ask, and most of our, our staff, I think, ask the same question. Okay, well, that, that's really easy to look at those three, what, but what does that really mean? And let's just start with the first one and identify what does that really mean when it says standard conditions? And really what we're talking about are the critical factors, right? Like, so we're the fire department, we got called to a fire, and it's like, well, that's that's going to be one of them probably all the time. And then a fire, again, like the fires in a a thousand square foot house is in an apartment building and, you know, mom's in the front yard, my kid's in the second floor. Okay. Well, that's just another piece of it, right? The fire's in the basement. That's just another piece of it. The fire's extended outside the building and running to the roof. That's another piece of it. So that, that slide that we use is a, is a big talking point to talk about the critical factors. Cause again, Chris, I think that that's what you just really described is we have to know what the problem is, which is 
what are these standard conditions that we can define based off the critical factors? And then we take some sort of a standard action to work through and solve it. But if we just have a list of standard actions but don't define what the problem is, you know, it's not going to work. Well, and that's kind of the, the issue, I think, that we talk about with, you know, SOP-based assignments aren't based on the conditions. They're not based on what's happening. They're not based on the building type and what's critical right now. It's based on us showing up, and it's what we feel like we need to do or what we, what we, what we normally do. So with this, we're actually measuring the problem, evaluating it. In a in a normal or in a standard way, really, and then and then saying, okay, we're gonna we're gonna go to work based on this stuff, right? And we're gonna deal with this right here and right now. So the big challenge with that is how do we measure it consistently? Like how do we? Uh, because like you know, my experience and I, and I would talk about in classes, I've taught a lot of college classes, you know, where we have up to a hundred students at a time in, in the, in the Phoenix system there, you know, they want to, they want to take the captain's test, right? So they, they get into the college system and they take tactics and strategy and all the other things that they feel like is going to help them in that process. So we would ask that question is like, okay, does everybody in here know how to do size up? And there's a hundred heads going, yeah, yeah, I know how to do it. Okay. Explain it to me. And then just shut up. And then there's literally a hundred different explanations of what size up is, where they start and all that. So it's been really important or it was important for us then. And I, I think we're seeing it now is to define what are the standard, the standard ways we start size up so that we actually get to where uh, we're all coming to a similar conclusion as to what is actually critical here. So s- defining a, a standard process and, and, and where we start with size up and, uh, and then evaluating the critical factors based on that stuff. And it's all tied to the work, right? So you hear the silverback guys talking about it's all tied to the work. Well, this incident command system wasn't designed for something for chiefs to do. Right. Because they were they just needed to occupy themselves. It was actually designed to make the work safer and better and 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 so that we're helping the community uh, in a more appropriate, organized way. And we're not dying on the fire ground. Well, so we need to develop the system inside there of how we think so that we're so we're maximizing that system and making good decisions. And uh, we're not. When we show up to a fire, uh, um, we're not we're not hiding under the bed, or or we're, we're not afraid to act because we don't we don't know or don't understand. So, yeah, I think when you look at the critical factors, um, just so for everyone who may not be a blue card user, or if you're kind of new to this, it's the first stop in our strategic decision making model. When we're on the scene and we're making a model, and Chris said it's not based on. SOPs or order arrival. It's based on having thinking incident commanders on the scene, both IC number one, IC number two, everyone that they're working with, everyone in the command team being at the same fire and being able to identify those critical fire ground factors as part of that size up. So um, I'll put up a graphic for our video viewers so you can see that strategic decision making model. But the, the importance of the critical fire ground factors is it is the first stop as you start to make those decisions on the fire ground. So, and then what if the youngest firefighter or the least experienced or just the firefighters in general were using that process to size up oh, where their line's going to go, where, where, where they want to push to once they make it through the threshold of the front door? Um, and because maybe the captain's not, or the supervisor, the, the, the boss is not always there to tell them exactly what to do because maybe they're getting the 360, they're, they're looking at other things. And so the, that level of the organization's using that process, then the company officers use that process in, in the same manner. And then when the battalion chief uh, shows up to be IC number two, he's utilizing the same exact process. The division boss is utilizing the same exact process. We've kind of connected and infiltrated that thing throughout all levels of the organization. So it's not a mystery to anybody um, uh, what's actually going on on the fire ground and what are the things that we need to be looking at and paying attention to. And I think I've heard you guys say it before. I know I heard you say it several years ago. Chief used to say it when he was doing command training was we were all at the same fire, you know, because, (laughs) because sometimes you hear radio traffic and it's like, are, are, is everyone here on the same incident? But I think having those, those fire ground factors, the critical factors and having them defined and having an agreement on, on how they look ahead of time. And that becomes the language that you speak 
within your organization, not only when you're training and you're pre-planning and you're talking about the what ifs or you're simulating, but also when you come back and do the after action reviews. So how, how do we start to dig in on, on what those factors are? So, I mean, there's eight of them, right? I mean, so that, that, that there's, a, there's eight broad uh, or focused words, I think, right. That, that, that are the critical factors. And then, like I said, there's thousands, right? So, you know, if we talk about fixed building occupancy and arrangement, I mean, we could sit here till tomorrow and talk about building, right? I mean, coming in here today from the airport, I'm driving past some other stuff they're building here, and it's like, what in the world are they doing to us, mm-hmm. right? And then, you know, occupancy type, it's like, <laughs> yesterday it was a jewelry store, and today it's a pawn shop, and, you know... Uh, Houses are being converted to businesses and, you know, they're building uh, these big box facilities, you know, all over the all over the country. And then, you know, a company moves out and we have multiple of them all across our region in Hamilton County, Ohio, where uh, a 600 to 1 million square foot building now has 30 occupancies in it. And one of the occupancies in there has 100 class A motorhomes in it and every one of them are over a million dollars and it was not designed in any way shape or form to have that right so i mean the, that's the occupancy you know piece of it so and then arrangement i mean it, we say that it we kind of know how it's how things are, are laid out but we, when we talk about arrangement we talk about you know like primary arrangement like how how's the building laid out maybe and then secondary arrangement is like where does this building sit on this plot of land and how do i get to it and how is it accessible and is there another way into it and we talk about the train wreck apartment buildings right like don't block yourself or anybody else in because the people in 1403 called it in but the fire is in 2403 across the way so you know let's get there figured out what's really going on so that that's that's the first three but I think everybody listened to this. I mean, if you just took a building, started going through in your mind everything with a building, whether it's construction or how old it is or uh, uh, layout, all of those things, right? It's like it's a lot. It's a lot of things to consider. So I'll let Chris take the well. So the rest. if you if you look at it from like if you're a fire department, your organization, you're training folks or you're the, the ops boss or whatever, and you're trying to figure out. And we're saying, yeah, there's eight critical factors, right? That's that's the eight big categories, right? And there's a ton of stuff that can potentially be inside of all those. Well, gosh, how do, what do, how do we how do we manage all that, right? Well, what what if what if our what if our training and our our focus was is if if we want us to, if we want us as an organization at, at all levels to be better at understanding when and why bu- the building is a critical factor, then we probably should be, be be doing some training on understanding construction and the general ideas of how these buildings should go together and what they do in a when how they divide them and maybe more importantly how they fall apart right when when stuff's under fire uh, under fire. Um, and then spending that time in life, life safety, right? If we're trying to f- actually figure out if life safety is a problem on the front end of an incident, then we should know and understand all the critical data and research information that is out there from UL. Um, that there's there's the research side, like the the scientific research side, the empirical uh, type data that we get from UL and and NIST and the the stuff that we'll be getting from National Fire Sprinkler Association. And those type of stuff, and then there's the experiential data that's out actually out there. The you know Project Mayday being like the biggest and foremost one, and then we look at the the, the firefighter rescue survey and other things. Is there there's important information there, and it's how we utilize it. And and yes, it's only as good as the information that gets put into it and how and how it gets managed. But I do feel like they have all of those. They have the intent to try and get the right information out into the community. So. So, so what do we actually know about that stuff? What are we training on? What are we identifying as usable information for crews? And then, then lastly, like if we want to pick the fire, fire and smoke, because uh, I like to include them together, right? One that usually doesn't happen without the other um, is what do we know about fire behavior? 
What do we know about it? And then let's like connect all this stuff together, the building, the fire, the life safety, the occupancy, the arrangement, and say, okay, these, all these things added together make a real serious problem. But really the most critical things I need to deal with on the front end here is that fire, where it is, my ability to get there. And then can I simultaneously or immediately following that, can I start dealing with this life safety issue that I think I've got here? And um, because... That, number one, helps us be focused with the action on the fire ground in a, in, a, in a way better way. And then that helps us not get screwed up um, because when you look at line of duty death, serious incident reporting, um, when there's fire in a structure and we're making our way in there, whether we say we're searching or whether we say we're for a fire attack, um, likely when the bad thing happened, there was very little to no water actually going on the fire. And and then when we go to try and solve that problem, there's the same is happening. There's very little to no water actually going on the fire. So um, the critical factors tie that together. And if we like if we've got a reasonably clear vision of the, the critical factors, then the work we should have a reasonably clear vision of what the work should look like in order to do it. So last week or two weeks ago, Chris, we we're doing some company officer stuff, you and Eric, and you pulled a picture up and. Uh you know, they, the the people, the group automatically throws out, oh, that's a balloon frame building. And it's like, oh, well, that's a different factor based on where the fire location is. And then somebody says, well, fire looks like it's on the first floor, but did it start in the basement, right? So if you're in basement land, that's a whole nother piece because we know operating above a basement fire is not the place to be. So it's it's that, again, back to the evaluation of critical fire ground factors. You just can't go and run through the front door without seeing the big picture of what is really going on. And that's the what is the critical factors. Yeah, and it becomes counterintuitive for us to wait till we have more information. I'm not going to rush to action because I, well, I, I see it. I want to I do something about it. Well, if we take the 20 seconds or however long it takes to get a 360 to better by define actually where the fire is, that will save us huge amount of time on the back end, right? Because number one, we're probably better at getting water to the fire. Number two, we're probably not going to get screwed up in a mayday situation. And uh, and then we can actually do what's best for Mrs. Smith, who's likely inside there, and we're not screwing around with trying to fix our own problem. I've seen uh, some departments, and this really should be the gold standard, and you can't pre-plan every single building in your community, but on the pre-plans for the commercial buildings that they are doing, they actually list the critical factors. So right away, when you're bringing your companies up out there as a company officer, battalion chief, as a battalion, however you're organized, you're, you're talking that language ahead of time with all the members of the company. So like one of them that I saw was a, a loading dock area, that the loading dock area is prone to flooding, especially if there's been a sprinkler activation. And they actually had a fire in this facility a number of years ago where, where a crew fell off the loading dock and they were submerged in about five to six feet of water. And it kind of took them a second to get out of it. So that's an important thing to know. So they, they start listing these things out about the building and the actions they're going to have to take. But they're using our language, the blue card language, when they're pre-planning that, which I really think is a, a, a very smart way to do that because it gets every firefighter in that company or every firefighter in the organization on up talking the same language once again. Yeah. So to kind of to that point is, is after we taught, I think maybe in Wilmington, Eric, uh, Eric Phillips, who's a company officer in Las Vegas, takes that strategic decision-making process and maybe more critically, the, the size up part of it and figuring out the, the critical factors stuff back to his firehouse and his company and in a very low tech way, right? With pictures or slides sits down with his crew from the newest. And I know he has rookie or probationary firefighters on his rig regularly to everybody, the more senior people in his, in his firehouse and his company and goes through it and start, all right, no, let's start working through this. Let's talk and think out loud here. Right. And, uh, um, and gives them that opportunity opportunity and gives them that the tool so it, you didn't need departmental resources to do this and um and trust me if we if, if we're left to our own devices we usually do stuff in firehouses that we probably all get in trouble for so this is at least an opportunity to spend doing something or a little bit of time doing something that's constructive and it will pay dividends on the fire ground i i have seen it
seen it from an organizational level of training with it deliberately and then being able to measure from one promotional process to the next promotional process where we had a very deliberate training system in between and seeing a market improvement in understanding fireground factors and then and then and then doing the right stuff afterwards that um i i i'm convinced it works so i i well i guess we're we'll see we'll see if it works for other people Mm -hmm. i've seen too where you know under the subset of building those those different features that a building might have so ventilation systems you know you end up with a ventilation system that if you activate it too soon you're actually going to lead to some fire spread some of the buildings that were built in the mid to late 80s have um, ventilation systems built into them that cannot be reset that they, those are doors that automatically open or windows that automatically open and if they're accidentally activated you're going to have to go manually shut them if, if you're going to shut them at all. And it just depends on, on the involvement. So that is really good information to have ahead of time. And I think the other point of this, you know, we were talking about the silverback guys talking about the work all the time. Well, this is about the work. If, if, if you're in an organization where, and you know it, when your focus is going down the wrong path, and I've seen it happen before where um, the firefighters are sitting around talking about the politics of the community or uh, the parks department got this and we didn't or whatever that's the time to get them to focus on the critical factors of the buildings in their first due i mean it's a very simple exercise like captain phillips does or you know anybody listening to this can do just load them up get them out and and start start asking those questions when you get in front of the building even if you don't have a pre-plan so i think when we talk about critical factors and we can i think we can jump to some of the things that you 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 brought up chris because everybody wants to talk about fire and and life safety right that's what we say we're there for that's really the only reason we're there right is we're the fire department and we're there to preserve and save life and property right so you know when you start talking about critical factors and you can pull up some pictures and just you know mock it up even like with known information or, or, or known victims you know that's always a good discussion with the critical factors and i think we've seen that plenty of times where uh you know maybe fire departments aren't as prepared as they think they are Mm -hmm. to address some of those factors. Right. So, uh, you know, we have, we have plenty of organizations that, you know, that are, that, that that are going to, they're doing a lot of work. We we use them a lot on our podcast there. They are pulling people out and they've identified, you know, if we have a, we, we respond and we're going to do searches. And if we pull somebody out, you know, that we did, but if we have a known victim, you know, they're, they're doing some things with resource because they're like, we aren't sure that we had enough resource because we we pulled out well i mean the, the, some of the data right that's out there whether whether where, where, no matter where you're getting it if you find one pretty good chance there's another one right so you know how many companies are you losing that that are doing work and uh you know and 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 in my neighborhood area and in, in our county uh you know terrible event and it 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 occurred more than once in the last couple of years a multifamily apartment complex, they end up pulling out multiple kids and it's like they just kept coming. And well, medic units were there, but delayed, you know, in one case, more than four kids. Well, the engine company's not leaving them. Like the kids needed medical attention. They were doing CPR on them, right? So it's like, now what's going on with the fire? So when you start like having those discussions about the critical factors and it's like, well, yeah, we went there to put the fire out and we're going to do searches and we're going to get all clears, right? That's what we do. And we're going to do it in a very organized, in a very organized way and, and prioritize the work that we're going to do based off of the factors. <clears throat> but when it pops up, okay, we got one victim for an incident commander. That's like a trigger, right? Like, okay, well, engine 17 is probably done. And now rescue 201 is with them. And then the next transmission is squad seven. We just found another victim. And it's like... Okay, well, now I just now squad seven's committed and is your other medic unit there? Like what exactly is going on with that? So I think when you start having those discussions and going through that process of the strategic decision making model, but with a focus on the critical factors, you know, I think it draws the attention to, again, back to the work that we do. And what does that really mean? And how do I make decisions? And you're having that discussion before it actually happens instead of. Well, we think we're okay. This is this is our standard response, and we make it work. God, I hope but, we don't find anybody. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's like, 
<clears throat> so uh, on multiple occasions, I think we've we've had that and experienced that with with organizations that are like, yeah, we we changed how we do business because, yeah, we go there and we search and we, you know, are going to put the fire out, but you 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 start losing one company at a time doing patient care with a with a uh, with a with a rescue unit or medic unit or whatever. You know that that has a big impact on what you can do with your incident action plan because you can only do the work you can do with the people that you got. So what if what if we what if we started talking about fire victims and our incident command and that kind of stuff in the same way that we talk about maydays? Mm-hmm. And so we say you better be doing everything right when something goes wrong. Well, what if we have the mentality as ICs as fire departments as blue card agencies that says. We better be doing everything right when we find a victim. And that means having the right amount of resources there, having companies in the right places, and and being ready to manage that to the best of our ability. I think sometimes we we shortchange that because we don't fire fi- victims at every fire, right? And you may you may you may run 20, 30, 40 fires without without finding a victim, but on that one, are you actually ready when you act when you do and are are you ready for if you find one, expect to find more type of thing. So I, I see um us addressing that and when we say it's a critical factor, um life safety is a critical factor, then then we should uh resource and act as if it is a critical factor with the intent that we're actually going to find a victim. And when we don't, we don't, right? And, and I, I'm not saying, you know, you should have a general alarm. All, all units are going to a fire just because you think you're going to find a victim. No, we're going to do it in a, an organized way. And then it just like in a mayday, if you come across a victim in most evolved fire systems, there's an automatic response that comes from the dispatch center of sending more resources, right? So shouldn't there maybe be an automatic response then from a dispatch center that if they if they either re- serious reports of victims or we actually have real reports of victims from fire companies that then we ad- we adjust our uh, automatically with with the resources that are coming. So um uh, yeah, I think there's uh, uh again, it's a it's it's action that's based on critical factors um and but they have to be real and manageable uh, measurable and manageable not just we're going to do it because we think they're there every single time no when i get there i'm actually gonna I'll, I'll leave the barn every single time thinking yeah i'm going there to save somebody but when i get there i'm gonna actually measure whether it's reasonable to think i'm gonna and then put the right action in place in the la- I, and i like the fact that you're you're coupling fire with smoke because there's been multiple uh, deaths, fire ground fatalities in the last couple of months where tank water put the fire out, but the smoke was such a big problem that it ends up killing three or four or five of the occupants of the building. And, th- and that's happened in two different places. And talking to those departments, they were like, yeah, it didn't take any water to put the fire out. But we had a huge problem managing the victims. You know, we had we had so many victims that it took multiple companies to 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 manage the patient care on those victims. John, since you brought that up, and we're going to do everything we can as quickly as we can, right? And, and prioritize things, you know, based off of that life safety and all of that. And Chris, you'll have to help me with exactly what they're calling it. But the U.S. Fire Administrators Roadshow with NFSA and everybody. Yeah, uh, you know, Steve Kerber, I, I've I, I don't know, I've seen it ten or so times now. Where we we know this, right? We, if you can't get yourself out, the fire department chances of getting you out is not good. Like so, and it, it's it, literally going down mm-hmm. every day, mm-hmm. right? And it's like it's not because we're not doing our job; it's because conditions right it's because of what's burning the smoke it's so i mean and, and you know the push is obviously you know close your door sleep your door closed all that you got to have smoke detectors you know shane ray's push is you better have a sprinkler system because mm-hmm. you know that that's just another piece of it but that's another critical factor that we got to stay connected to that's another one of those latest research it ain't 1970 no more like you're not you ain't gonna you ain't you, <laughs> I'm not saying it can't happen but you're probably not pulling grandma out of the room that was on fire with her and, and her gonna be alive anymore because of of what is burning in there, and it can happen. And I'm not saying we're not still gonna do that, but my point is that 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 whole when they're saying that with research and it's all of those people 
that are doing this all across the country that are saying it, whether it's FSRI, UL, NIST, the U.S. Fire Administrator, Shane Ray, uh, I think Chief Lieb's been the I mean, I, it's a it's a real problem, and that's just another critical factor thing. So it's like, so it's time. Like, how much time do we really have? Here And that's when it comes back to the critical thinking, decision-making thing. Like, this ain't that I'm going to pull up and wait 10 minutes and do something. All of this decision-making has to happen in, like, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, right? And then we're taking immediate action. But if we're going to do that, then you have to have a system, and you have to use it all the time, and you have to have talked about it, right? And exercise it. you got to exercise the system and exercise your mind for making those decisions, because that's what needs to get engaged when you pull up. Yeah, not just having it a policy, actually mm-hmm. exercising it, knowing how to. So on, on what, what, what Steve, what, and I think it's actually underplayed right now in the American Fire Service, is what, 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 the, what, what Steve Kerber and FSR is saying in connection with the, the, the U.S. Fire Administrator, administrator um, is saying it's never been more dangerous to be inside uh, a structure during a fire, and you've never had less time to escape than right now. Those the fire service better be heeding those words. Quite honestly, um, I just to my point, I wrote those words into my the strategic plan I just did for my organization because I want my community to know this is what we're thinking about. So when I ask you for for resources, you understand what I'm trying to what 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 peril you're actually in if you have a fire in your home. So I, I think that's incredibly poor, important. And then and then you mentioned uh, Frank Lee from the FDNY. So when he was speaking, and, and I've heard him do it at a few different places. When he was speaking at the Hazard Zone Conference this past October, and he'll be there again this this coming October, um, he was talking about the Twin Parks fire in in New York City. Uh, and and I, I believe it was 19 fatalities. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, and 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 he describes you know some pretty amazing and heroic work. But what it comes down to was the fire on the third floor was creating smoke conditions on every other floor above it. And if I, I think it was like 19 or 20 floors total and people were dying on floors, 10, 15 floors above that fire. Um, because every time the crews went in to try and deal with the fire, they're coming across another victim and they're actually having to deal with it. And it wasn't until they were able to say, no, no, we have to get to the fire and put the fire out to stop the threat for everybody else in this building that that it started to get better and they could start to try and get on top of this reaction. So that putting the fire out thing based on critical factors um, and the recognition of that, uh, it's, we're not supposing, we're talking about actual incidents that really happened um, is, is pretty, pretty important. So I think that's just scratches the surface of, of, you know, when we're talking about the the fire ground factors and especially critical fire ground factors. How do we continue this conversation aside from the podcast for everyone listening to to keep digging into it and and keep uh, engaged? I mean, we talked about some things to engage, but really, you know, what what's next for for somebody who's listening to this? So I think I mean, uh, John, you're going to put the strategic decision making model on there. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if you can put the eight the eight uh, critical fire ground factors on there, which is, you know, the first box in the strategic decision-making model, then people can start that discussion of like, what, is, what does this really mean? And what does it really look like? And uh, you know, it, 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 most of the time it gets breezed over. Like it's, yeah, this is just the process, but there's so much that you can dig into. Yeah. All right. We will. Yeah. There's, there's, there's tools and, and if you really want to get sick of hearing about it, come to one of the workshops because Eric and I'll talk about it for 16 hours over two days. That's and then awesome. We'll set it up for them. Good. Well, great discussion today, guys. Hey, before we go, let's uh, do a timeless tactical truth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cassini's Timeless Tactical Truths, and today's Timeless Tactical Truth is beware of the chief who says, don't do anything until I get there. Um, you know, we, we think sometimes that that's a relic of the past, 
But uh, we continue to see incidents unfold in, in different jurisdictions where either the chief gets on the radio and they start uh, taking command before they're even on the scene and giving orders, or they're literally doing that, just telling everybody to stand by until I get there. So how, how, what, what advice do we have for folks who are living within that system? This might run, this, we might run this one a little long, John, but uh, the buck slip just came out. Steve Lester just put out the three C's, right? Confident, confident, and control. So it's the first part of it. And if, 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 you're, if you're dealing with the chief that does this, then they're missing all of that, right? They're missing, they're missing uh, the whole thing of what they really can do, and then uh, – they don't trust their people, which either that's a training issue. They're they're failing in training their people and 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 being part of one system and everybody working together. Because when the chief gets there, they're they're just re no, they're just reinforcing command that's already been established and supporting the work that's already happened. They're it's not like nothing happens till they get there, right? I mean, in, in a lot of systems, we hear it all the time. There's five companies working before a chief gets there. And, and, and sometimes we hear, you know, some of these people in these bigger organizations, Chris, you worked in one, you know, you get there and there's four companies working. It's like they got it under control and I'm not even going to I'm here. And if you need me to, I'll take it. But it sounds like you got it. So, I mean, I, there, there's all kinds of, of that. I mean, that's the bully thing. I, I know more than you. Most of the time, I think that leads back to the they really don't know shit. And and then they then there's a trust issue, too. But I mean, that's that's. That's my take on it. We have some of that going on in in uh, some areas that I know of. Yeah, it's it, you might as well just that chief might as well be just waving a gigantic banner, uh, exclaiming how shitty I've done of a job of training my folks, right? Like how how poorly uh, I've set them up. It's it's accountab- it's accountability model stuff, right? So how poorly I established expecta- or expectations or standards, how poorly I've actually trained them um, that I don't trust them enough to actually do the work without me being there and being able to tell them how uh, how it should be done and all that other stuff. So it's a it's a selfish position that that IC takes. Um, and, um, they probably, they probably hate his guts at the dinner table just as much as they hate his guts on the fire ground. And, um, I, I don't, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's, that's everything the boss wasn't. I can tell you that. Yeah. And you know, I worked for a chief in the mid nineties that he was the first one because I, I think, you know, we had a lot of, you know, I'm the chief, I'm responsible for all this if anything goes bad. So I'm going to be the one to make the decision. But this guy actually said, this fire department should run the same today with me here as if I left for six months and no one should notice, which meant that we were all trained the same way, whether that was taken command. We knew what tasks to do on the fire ground. I mean, we, we were a well-trained machine. And when he ended up uh, leaving that department to go to another, the community was coming unglued. And he's like, you guys are going to be fine because we set this department up for success and everyone's been trained to keep things going just as they are right now. So that that's that um, secure type uh, leader. And I think a lot of times when you see these guys who uh, don't want to share the knowledge and also don't want to share that decision-making responsibility, those are the insecure leaders that we have out there. But if if you're um, either new to a, a chief officer position or you're thinking about taking it, I think setting your organization up so that you are prepared, whether you're there or not, is is the main goal. I mean, at the, and that's, that's really, you know, the organization I, I just retired from, that's why uh, several years ago, our first career hires were battalion chiefs because we recognize we want leadership on duty every single day. And it, and it shouldn't be dependent on three or four chiefs being in town, which a lot of systems out there are. We talk about big systems a lot with, with B-Shifter, but most systems are reliant on somebody coming from home or a mutual aid chief. So continuing to train your people, getting them up to speed on what incident command truly is, either through blue card, hopefully it's through blue card, however that is, you're, you're going to set that department up for success to make those decisions. All right. Good one, guys. Uh, appreciate everyone being here today. We'll uh, be back soon with another 
B Shifter. Hey, make sure that you look at our show notes. We've got a lot of stuff coming up. So whether it's uh, the workshops that Chris was talking about, uh, you know, we're, we're doing one in Phoenix. We're going to be on the road doing those. Don't forget about the Hazard Zone Conference coming up. It kicks off September 30th in Cincinnati, Ohio. Get registered for that. Until next time, thanks so much for listening to B Shifter. Shifter.